The Babes in the Woods case reveals a great deal about how predatory paedophiles operated in the 1970s. After 30 years, we finally brought closure for the families of Gary Handlin and Susan Blatchford. I always wished that it had just been a murderer because when they told me what he'd done to my son, I've never been able to cope with that. It is imperative, of course, that serial killers are caught as soon as possible, and most are apprehended within months of committing their crimes, but some manage to evade capture for many years. In the case of the Babes in the Wood murders, it was a quarter of a century before the police discovered who the killer was. So how did this man avoid detection for so long? And why did Ronald Jebson admit to his guilt after 28 years? I'm Fred Dynage and I'm investigating Britain's most infamous murderers. I want to know what turns them into killers, sentencing themselves to death or a lifetime behind bars. The deaths in March 1970 of 11-year-old Susan Blatchford and 12-year-old Gary Hanlon shock the nation. They were found in a shallow grave in a wood at the edge of Epping Forest. Over the years, this tragedy has remained in the public consciousness and become known as the Babes in the Wood murders. The abduction and murder of a child is the most disturbing of all crimes, striking at the very heart of youthful innocence. One man who studied the extraordinary events that led to the capture of the Babes in the Wood killer is retired Detective Chief Inspector Declan Donnelly. Gary, at the time, uh, was uh, 12 years old. Very, very small uh, for, uh, for his age, so very much on the, on the, on the slight side, but uh, from what I know, a uh, very exuberant um, young lad, uh, very much into, uh, into his football, and definitely a young lad who would like to be outside, nothing better than kicking a ball round, and wandering around the fields and all the open spaces that existed then in that part of, uh, of Enfield. Gary Hanlon was a year older than Susan Blatchford. They both lived in the suburban area of Enfield in North London. They were school friends and had only known each other for a few months. Susan originally had her eye on Gary's brother Frank, who was a few years older, but had decided she preferred Gary. At the time, uh, in, in Enfield, uh, Susan lived uh, at Riley Road, which is only a short distance uh, away from, from Marilyn Avenue, um, where um, Gary uh, lived. I think she enjoyed, probably, with uh, Gary kicking a ball around. Very, very much, uh, I think, um, described by her mother, Muriel, uh, as a bit of a tomboy. Uh, but again, uh, very, very vivacious, uh, very, very outgoing. On the 31st of March, 1970, Gary Hanlon's mother, Beryl, returned home from work. She picked up her children from a neighbour who'd been watching them after school. Beryl and Gary's brother, Frank, remember the day well. I got home at four, went over, got uh, Sharon and Gary. He went straight into the garden, got his football, and then there was a, a knock at the door, and it was Susan. And she said, uh, can Gary come out to play? I said, well, he could play down the side here, right, the side to my house. I said, but he's not allowed to go out the gate. And I thought, I, I, you could always hear his football. I, was, I had his, his very special dinner that he liked was lamb chops and roast potatoes and everything. And I said to him, dinner won't be long, it's all in the oven. He said, oh, lovely. And I never heard his ball when I looked out and he was gone. The young friends left the house and headed off, with Gary carrying his football. So he went out um, with Susan um, into the, uh, the, the street, Marilyn Avenue, and then 
As far as uh, we're aware, um, there were a few people, uh, school friends of Susan, who saw her in Marilyn Avenue. And um, there are some sightings, again, uh, from, from people who uh, knew Susan, saying that they crossed the Sewardson Road and made their way up through, through a gateway near the uh, Royal Oak Public House, made their way up towards uh, a cops area. The young friends Gary Hanlon and Susan Blatchford headed towards Sewardstone Green in Chingford. This would be the last time they'd ever be seen alive. In 1970, 24 children under the age of 14 had gone missing in London, but most had been found within the first 24 hours. The night of March the 31st turned bitterly cold, and on April the 1st, it snowed. Neither Gary nor Susan had returned home. I just thought he'd gone down to meet his dad and Frank off the bus. You know, I, well, I thought that's what, what it was. And then when he never came back with them, I knew there was something wrong. I went straight to the police station at Ponder's End. That was my nearest police station, and, and Susan's dad came with me. What did they say to you? I think it was only about seven o'clock in the evening. They said, we, we can't really go out, send anybody out, because he might have stayed at a friend's. Has he got any friends where he would have stayed? Is there anywhere where he'd have gone? And I said, no. He wouldn't be out in the dark because he's frightened of the dark. And that's why I think the police decided to go out searching earlier than what they would normally do. And Frank? What are your memories of that night? I suppose when you're 15, you're just thinking, perhaps you're just being a bit of a scally and just, you know, as you would playing truant or anything else. Um, and then obviously by the next morning, you worry and panic. The police search for the missing children, helped by family and friends. No trace of Gary or Susan was found. On the day after, on the 1st of April, Scotland Yard were called in. Detective Chief Superintendent Leonard Reed, the man who put the craze behind bars, took control of the investigation. The hours turned into days, and the days became weeks. He felt that this is just not two missing persons. This is something a lot more serious. So he expended huge amounts of his own time and obviously the time of, uh, of the officers under his command. There was the use of uh, tracker dogs, looking at all the uh, fields, surrounding fields, far out to Waltham Abbey, all around that particular area. So if, you, if you're familiar with the area, you know that it is quite vast, or was then in terms of the open spaces, the green fields, the woods. The hunt for Susan and Gary involved over 500 police officers. 15,000 people were interviewed and 4,000 homes searched. It was a huge operation in terms of searching. Searching houses, searching outbuildings, following up leads from, from, from many members, of the thousands of leads from members of the public. The interesting part um, about this, and um, Leonard Reed told me this himself, I think it was the first time, according to Mr Reed, that a helicopter had actually been used in the search for, for missing children. The police questioned many suspects from the surrounding area, including convicted child sex offender Ronald Jebson. The police interviewed him twice, but Jebson had an alibi. Criminologist Professor David Wilson knows just how difficult it can be for the police to narrow down a list of suspects with very little evidence to go on. Ronald Jebson was rounded up and interviewed because he was a convicted uh, paedophile who was living in the local area of Enfield at the time. He had been released from prison in 1970, having been convicted of uh, entering a six-year-old girl's bedroom and sexually assaulting her. So he was released back into the 
community at the time that Susan and Gary go missing. And more importantly, he had just been arrested for uh, sexually assaulting an 11-year-old boy in the Nottingham area. So it was quite natural that the police would want to interview anybody that had that kind of offending past um, because they were going to be suspects that would have to be ruled out of the investigation. And what you also have to bear in mind, this was, this was one person out of possibly hundreds that were, were suspects at the time. There was no technology that you have now to put things into a computer to what I would say to join up the dots. What you were working on was a, without getting into it too much, a card system. So in other words, you would have cards with, there's a vehicle seen there, for example. There's a witness who's been interviewed there. There's something we must follow up, and this is on another card. So he was interviewed and then released. Why was he that convincing? Well, Jebson had an alibi. He was able to persuade the police uh, conducting the interview that he'd been staying at the home of Robert and Maureen Papper. So he basically was able to explain that he and Maureen and Robert Papper had spent the weekend together, had gone to the labor exchange to enroll for uh, work, uh, and in effect, Jebson was able to persuade the police that he couldn't possibly be guilty of these murders, partly because of the fact that the, that the Pappers were able to provide an alibi. On the 17th of June 1970, a man walking his dog on the edge of Epping Forest made a gruesome discovery, a shallow grave containing two bodies, just a few miles from where the missing children lived. Gary Hanlon and Susan Blatchford had been found. I'm exploring the case of the Babes in the Wood murders and the man behind the horrific killings, Ronald Jebson. On the 31st of March, 1970, 12-year-old Gary Hanlon and 11-year-old Susan Blatchford went out to play in Enfield, North London. They'd gone for an innocent kickabout, but had never returned home. 11 weeks later, two bodies were discovered in nearby Epping Forest. Their bodies were discovered in a hide by a, a gentleman out walking his dog, and uh, his dog was attracted to the hide, and once that particular person, that gentleman, pulled away the, uh, the foliage, he was able to see what he thought was uh, human remains. Now, clearly, if a body is out in the open for that length of time, there's going to be a lot of animals uh, uh, eat parts of the body, their internal organs had gone, albeit they were both still clothed, with the exception of Susan's bra, her knickers, her stockings had gone missing. Susan and Gary had been found just a few miles from Gary's house. They were laying together in such a position that they appeared to be hugging each other. This, and being found in Epping Forest, earned them the name Babes in the Woods. How did you hear the news of what had happened to, to Gary? We heard late that night. Um, we, we didn't... They just said they'd found two bodies, and my brother-in-law come round and said he'd heard it on the news. And um, because we never went to bed for the whole 12 weeks, we just sat in the front room and I kept the fire going and the light on and uh, the reporters came round. When you heard the news, what, what effect did it have on you, personally? You didn't come out of your room for about three weeks, did you? I didn't eat for two weeks. No, you never. Uh, people were trying to force me into eating and talking to me and all the rest of it. I don't know, it's, it's just like um, part of you being ripped away. It's just everything seems so fine, I suppose. And um, that's where it's been ever since, to be honest with you. Yeah. The children's remains were exhumed and taken to the medical examiner. They underwent a series of tests, but the examiner was unable to ascertain the cause of death. The body of, uh, of Susan, when that was actually examined, uh, it was found that her trousers had been split at the sides and pulled down. Um, her underwear had been uh, removed and, and taken away um, and then 
trouser just folded back uh, over, her, um, over her body. When further examination was taken at uh, the mortuary, um, what was interesting, they were able to look at this and decide, well, how, how, how could this have occurred? And I'm aware that uh, Leonard Reed never thought that uh, either of these children on the 31st of March when they went missing had actually laid down in a copse and, and died. The Babes in the Wood murders is thought to have been one of the only crimes Detective Chief Superintendent Leonard Reed didn't solve during his time at Scotland Yard. Throughout the 1960s, the level of awareness about child abduction had increased significantly. In 1965, the Moores murders hit the headlines, with Ian Brady and Myra Hindley kidnapping and killing five children. These were followed by the Cannock Chase murders between 1964 and 1967, where three young girls had been tragically killed. Cases such as these prompted campaigns highlighting the danger of strangers. Children were told never to get into a car with someone you don't know. This time is seen as a turning point in how we view safety in childhood. Professor David Wilson is going to explain exactly the reality of that danger today. I've gone out into the streets to ask members of the public how many kids, on average, do they think are abducted and murdered by strangers in England and Wales on any given year. So let's listen to what people have said about that particular question. A thousand to two thousand, roughly? In the UK alone? Uh, ten. About five? You hear so many, but there's probably a lot you don't hear. Oh, oh what? Seven hundred. Four and a half thousand. Maybe see a couple of hundred. So, Fred, a, a real range of views there. What do you think? I would think a very low figure. I would agree with the gentleman who said 10, but I'd also agree with people who think there are probably many, many more children who disappear, who go missing, that we don't hear much about. Well, on average, and this is a figure that's remained stable since the 1970s, six children a year are abducted and murdered by a stranger. So we're dealing with a very rare phenomenon. Here's our next question that we asked members of the public. How many children a week are murdered by their parents or carers? In the 30s, something like that. I would say eight, two or three a week, maybe. Maybe 50. Maybe a couple of dozen. Well, it's actually two children a week will be murdered by their parents or carers. But the key thing here is that sense in which the public think children are going to be threatened by a stranger, stranger danger, whereas in fact the phenomenon of murder is that a child will be murdered by someone who is in a relationship with that child. The next question I wanted to ask members of the public is which age group do they think is most likely to be murdered in England and Wales? Very young, I suppose, because they're so vulnerable. Nought to three. Teenagers who've been out drinking, so 16 to 18 year olds. Between 14 and 18, I reckon that's the age where children are starting to grow up and they're starting to venture out, you know, through social networking, via the internet, they're able to get more freedom and then that's when they're likely to encounter the wrong people. Age group between 11 and 15. Statistically, the age group that's most likely to be murdered are children below the age of 12 months. No. When we discuss our murder case book, you know, we, we're discussing quite unusual cases because the pattern of murder in England and Wales is it's likely to be a child and that child is likely to have been killed by someone that they know. But there's always the evil exception to the rule, someone like Jebson. And Jebson is the, the classic example of the kind of predatory paedophile who will abduct and murder a child who is not known to him. He is effectively every parent's worst nightmare in that respect. The inquest in September 1970 reached an open verdict. The police had no leads and scientific evidence couldn't prove whether the children had died from exposure or foul play. 
Some of Susan's clothes were missing, but this was put down to possible wild animals. But the parents were not convinced. Reed didn't believe that these children hadn't been murdered, and nor, more importantly, did the families of either Susan or Gary. In fact, Susan's mother said the only animal that could have removed Susan's bra and pants and stockings is a human animal, and that person needs to be caught or he will strike again. Just as Muriel Blatchford predicted, another child would die at the hands of the killer. But it would take police another 28 years to discover who the killer was. But one man who'd been questioned and released by the police knew more than he'd revealed, Ronald Jebson. He'd been born Ronald Harper in 1938 but had his name changed when he was adopted by the Jebson family who lived at Hatfield in Hertfordshire. We know relatively little about him during his childhood other than the fact that he was seen as a bit odd. He was often quite lonely. Um, he would be able to try and get people to feel sorry for him. The other thing that we know about Jebson is that he was convicted of sexual offences within his teens. Now this is classic predatory paedophile behavior. From age 15, he's convicted of indecent exposure, then indecent assault, then sexual assault. So gradually, throughout his teens, throughout his 20s and 30s, we're going to see that the sexual offending that he engages in becomes more and more severe, which is typical of the pattern of predatory paedophiles. Considered a loner, he joined the army and was discharged. He frequently moved from place to place, changing his name and identity to keep his past history secret. There is suggestions that um, he was able to ingratiate himself with, with people, always seemed to be the one who'd been put upon, the one who was vulnerable, to get sympathy. So I think that was probably a part of him that would allow himself to work his way into the company of the people who he wanted to be with. So sometimes he'll use the name Ronald Jebson, other times he'll use his birth name, which was Ronald Harper. On other occasions, he will use a pseudonym Alan Purchase. What, is he married? Is he Christian? Is he Jewish? He constantly plays with his identity as a way deliberately, I think, of covering his tracks because, of course, he's a predatory paedophile. During this time, Ronald Jebson was in and out of prison. He was an alcoholic and amphetamine addict with prior criminal offences who once told a prison psychiatrist that he was evil and that he was afraid of himself. We know that he uh, frequented the, uh, the Enfield area. In fact, one of his convictions for sexual assault, um, he, in or around 1968, um, assaulted a five or six-year-old child. Uh, he went to prison for two years. On the 2nd of March 1970, Ronald Jebson was released from Wandsworth Prison. He moved to Enfield, but was soon visiting an old friend, Robert Papa, in Hatfield, just a few weeks before Susan Blatchford and Gary Hanlon disappeared. A coincidence or something more sinister? I'm reinvestigating the brutal killing of Gary Hanlon and Susan Blatchford, the Babes in the Wood murders. In 1970, both children have gone missing. They were discovered dead 11 weeks later. The medical examiner couldn't determine the cause of death and it was recorded as accidental. After the children disappeared, the police interviewed a number of suspects. Ronald Jebson was on that list and had given an alibi for the night in question. He was a convicted paedophile who only weeks before had been released from prison. Jebson had gone to stay with his old friend, Robert Papper. What's interesting about the Pappers is that clearly Robert Papper um, was an old school friend of uh, Jebson's. And therefore, one would think 
today that the Pappers would know a great deal about Jebson's offending history. Now, we're used to today simply Googling, going onto the internet, discovering things about individuals and about their past. But in 1970, especially with someone who is a predatory paedophile like Jebson, he would be adept at hiding his offending past. This is a man who's constantly lying about his past. Papa and Jebson were both unemployed, but had managed to buy a car. This allowed Jebson to expand his predatory territory. On the 4th of April, Jebson was arrested and charged for sexually assaulting an 11-year-old boy in Nottingham. He was sentenced to five years inside prison. Meanwhile, headlines were making the national newspapers of the missing children from Enfield in North London, Gary Hanlon and Susan Blatchford. When somebody who was convicted of sexual offences in the 60s and 70s, when they went to prison, there were literally very few treatments that would have been available to have helped a convicted paedophile try to change his behaviour. You know, I, I was a prison governor uh, by the early 1980s, and until the late 1980s, we still put convicted paedophiles isolated them, put them in the same wing, isolated them from the general population, and did absolutely nothing to overcome their sexual offending history. And therefore, you know, they, they were almost walking time bombs. As soon as they were released from prison in the 60s and 70s, they were almost guaranteed to offend again because literally nothing had happened to them in prison to change their offending behavior. Ronald Jebson served only three years of his five-year sentence before being released. Once again, his old school friend, Robert Papa, invited him back to his home. He made his way back to uh, where the Pappas lived and, again, asked them for, uh, for lodgings, whether he could stay with them. He, he, was, he was given some form of lodgings, whether it's just the settee for the night or, or, or a bedroom, it's not entirely clear. What happened? between the Pappas and uh, Jebson was some sort of falling out. Over, over what, one can only speculate, and that I don't know. But they fell out, and there is evidence to suggest that Jebson threatened the family. He threatened Robert Papa, he threatened him that he would get his own back, and that what he would do, uh, Papa would not like. Those words horrifically came true. Jebson didn't wait long to take his revenge. On the 9th of June, 1974, he went to the local primary school to pick up one of the Papa's daughters, eight-year-old Rosemary. He went to the school where Rosemary Papa went to. I believe that was a, a special, special needs school. And he picked her up in his car and uh, he drove her around uh, for a, a pe period of time. Jebson takes Rosemary to um, a field, uh, forces her to perform uh, oral sex on him, uh, and clearly he wanted to um, have full intercourse with this eight-year-old girl. She is crying, uh, drawing attention to herself, uh, and therefore, Jebson says he can't sustain an erection, so turns Rosemary onto her back and strangles her. Why would Rosemary Papa have gone with Jebson? You've got to remember that Rosemary Papa, this eight-year-old girl, would have known Ronald Jebson. He had lived in her home, so when Uncle Ron turns up at the school gates in his car, she would have thought nothing of it. She would simply presume that she was accepting a lift who was a friend of her mother and father's and gone with Jebson in his car. Predatory paedophiles have got to gain access to children and this was simply one of the, the ways that uh, Jebson was able to gain access to Rosemary because of course by that stage he wanted to punish Robert Papa for the fact that Robert had thrown Jebson out of their home. Ronald Jebson had killed eight-year-old Rosemary Papa, exacting his revenge on her family. 
but not content with Rosemary's murder, Jebson visited her best friend, eight-year-old Michaela Odwell, whose father he'd also befriended. I think I was about six months older than Rosemary. We lived just around the corner from each other. I met her when I was four, and we still kept in touch for another four years. She went to a different school, I went to a different school to her, but we always used to see each other every weekend, and we used to play around. She was blonde, blue eyes, she was a stunner. Over 40 years later, Michaela still remembers how Ronald Jebson's presence unsettled her whenever he was around. He had piercing eyes, and I mean piercing eyes. It's like he was looking right through you. He had dark hair, very cropped hair. Quite, I wouldn't say tall, but not short. I often said to my dad, I don't like him. There is something about him that I just don't like. And it's the way he spoke, the way his actions, the way he was looking at all of us as we grew up, especially me. There was something not right with him. Ronald Jebson arrived at the Oddwell's house, claiming his car had broken down. Dad said, you can keep on the sofa. He had a blood in the middle of his jumper. My dad said, well, what happened, Ron? And he went, oh, I cut myself. So my mother put the jumper in for so Then Dad told, us, told me to go to bed because, of course, school day. The next day, Michaela stayed home from school with a headache. My mother was in the garden talking to a neighbour. And I thought, oh, OK, I'll play with my toys. I had porcelain doll and porcelain tea set. I was playing with it, and suddenly I heard the stairs go. He opened my bedroom door, and he said to me, do you want to play a game? I said, what game? Before I knew it, he had me pinned to my bed. He was hitting me, and I'm screaming, hoping my mother would come in because my bedroom window was wide open. I'm screaming for help, no help came. Ronald Jebson was out of control. Michaela was his next target. Then suddenly, just as I was about to rape me, the back door went, it was my mother. He put Tempe in my hand and he said to me, if you ever tell anyone what I've been doing up here, I would do exactly what I did to Rosemary. I strangled her, I punched her, I hit her, and I raped her, and I'd do the same to you, he swore. So anyway, he went downstairs, and then I heard the front door go, it's my dad coming in from work. I asked my mother how I was. Oh, she's all right, as far as I know. Then suddenly I heard the front door go again. It was that thing leaving. Michaela was too scared to tell anyone what Jebson had told her. However, with Rosemary Papa missing, Jebson became the immediate suspect. The police saw he was a child attacker with several previous convictions, from theft to rape. 35-year-old Ronald Jebson was arrested the next day and immediately confessed to the murder of Rosemary Papa. He was convicted and sentenced to life with a minimum of 20 years. He made no mention of the fact he'd been interviewed four years previously over the babes in the wood killings. After all, he had an alibi. Or did he? I'm re-examining the babes in the wood killings, the horrific murders of 11-year-old Susan Blatchford and 12-year-old Gary Hanlon, and the man behind them, Ronald Jebson. In the spring of 1970, the two children disappeared and were found dead 11 weeks after they went missing. The verdict was recorded as accidental death. It wasn't until 26 years later, when the startling news found its way to Scotland Yard, that the truth was revealed. 
a convicted paedophile and child murderer, Ronald Jebson, serving time in Wakefield Prison, had confessed to a prison officer that he knew who'd killed the two children. In 1996, the case was reopened, and Detective Inspector Declan Donnelly led the investigation. He gave a set of circumstances. He explained how he'd been with the, the Pappas on that particular day, how they had visited the Enfield area. He talked about the fact that all three of them were in the car. Uh, they saw two children walking along, that they were enticed into the car and then taken back to this address um, of, of the Pappas. And they were then held for a number of days, according to him, and during that particular period, they were sexually abused numerous times, according to Jebson, by the Pappas. When asked what happened to the children, he replied, I don't know. Why would Jebson have done that after all those years? Usually in maximum security prisons, there is a hierarchy which has sex offenders as the lowest of the, of the low. They're reviled by most offenders. But most of the sex offenders are isolated from the main body of the prison population. And therefore, bizarrely as it might seem, there's a hierarchy amongst the sex offenders. And I slightly get the impression that he was trying to impress those other predatory paedophiles about the extent of his offending behavior. The police investigated the allegations made by Jebson against the Papa family. He'd originally used them as his alibi at the time when he was first interviewed by police. But when Robert Papa and his wife at the time were interviewed, they gave credible alibis for the 31st of March 1970, the day when Susan and Gary had disappeared. And they confirmed that Jebson wasn't with them, like he'd stated to police, when the children went missing. The original post-mortem was re-examined and bleeding into Susan's ribs, dismissed at the time, was questioned again. His view was that that bleeding into the ribs, that was blunt trauma. He said that that only could be caused by compression. And when asked to, well, what sort of compression? Somebody kneeling on the chest of that young girl, of Susan. Jebson was interviewed again by the police with the knowledge that the Pappas had no part in the deaths. He still denied any involvement in the killing of Susan and Gary, but was arrested for the murder of the two children. On Monday, the 24th of August, 1998, Ronald Jebson called Edmonton Police Station, saying he wanted to change his statement and confess to the murders of Gary Hanlon and Susan Blatchford. And in effect, he tells a story of spotting uh, these children as they were going to play in a field. He entices them into his car. He gives them alcohol. There is some indication he may also have given them some cannabis. He takes them uh, to an isolated spot where um, he is able to um, sexually assault um, Susan. As that sexual assault is taking place, Gary seemingly has tried to protect Susan, which meant that uh, Jebson had to attack Gary. One of the things that he actually told us was when, when asked, well, can you expand on that? Can you, ex can you explain in, in some more detail exactly how this assault took place? He then mentioned that he had actually knelt on her chest uh, when he was strangling her. So in other words, that provided that piece of corroboration. He gave that up voluntarily. He provided that bit of corroboration, which accorded with what we had from Dr. Heath. During the four hour confession, he told Declan Donnelly the full story. When you sit across the table and you're interviewing somebody like that, it's not until you look across it and you see how cold calculating how manipulative they can be. He talked about Little Ron. Little Ron was the insecure, the quiet person, the person who wouldn't literally say boo to a goose. 
inoffensive, wouldn't harm a fly. But there's Big Ron, and sometimes Big Ron gets the better of Little Ron, and Big Ron commits the deeds, the vicious deeds, the sadistic deeds, and Little Ron tries to prevent it, but he can't because he's overpowered. Ronald Jebson had kept his evil secret to himself for 28 years. Susan Blatchford's body was exhumed for forensic testing to try and prove his version of events. And Jepson, amazingly, even tried to infer at one stage the children had bought it on themselves. You know, I've worked a great deal with predatory paedophiles, and one of the most common things that a predatory paedophile will say to me is that actually the child came on to him as opposed to the other way around, that the child was interested in sex, not the predatory paedophile. These are called techniques of neutralization. These are ways in which the paedophile can explain away his sexual interest in a child by actually saying it wasn't him that was interested sexually, but the child that was interested. On the 28th of March 2000, Jebson was charged with the murders of Susan Blatchford and Gary Hanlon at Brent Magistrates Court. He received two life sentences. The killer of the babes in the woods had finally been convicted 30 years after committing his unspeakable crimes. And Frank, how did you react when you heard that news? Um. Obviously, it's an initial shock, but then it's, a, I don't know, it's a mixture of emotions. Part of me, I was glad. And another part of me, obviously sad. Um, but I'm glad it all came out. And I, I, I always wish that it, it had just been a murderer. Because when they told me what he'd done, to my son, I've never been able to cope with that because I'll keep visualising it. And mm. I've not seen, I never saw my son. They wouldn't let me see my son, so he was buried without me seeing him. So I still don't think that he's gone. One thing sticks in my mind. He, he turned around and he said, I started on Susan, I got hold of Susan. He said, and I think he's only little. <laughs> He said, and Gary went for him and he tried to fight me. He went, and I finished him in seconds. And that just, that hurt me. Jebson ruined your life, didn't he? Completely, yeah. That's what he done. He ruined all our lives. Mm. Ruined. And I... I still think he's going to come in. It's another, another thing I, I can't get over, because... I, knew, I wasn't allowed to see him, so I still, when Frank was showering with me, for a minute, I think, is it, I think, is it him? No, that oh. sounds a bit mad, and that's how I feel. Okay. He's not coming back, is he? I've forgiven him for what he's done to me. Because when he passes, dies, he'll have a lot more than to me to contend with. But I'm better than him. I think, to be honest with you, I've learned to respect people, to respect their differences, and not to judge anyone. But I judge myself. I can't help it. If I could take my whole insides out, give them a damn good wash and put them back, I'd be fine. But I can't do that. The most horrific crimes are those that involve the murder of children, especially those who've fallen victim to paedophiles. Ronald Jebson destroyed the lives of three children and left behind other victims of his abuse. Today, the media brings these threats and anxieties closer than ever, and it seems that nobody's children are safe. With just six children killed each year, it seems a small number, and yet one is one too many.